Welcome to Hydroclate Science's third video. I am Kevin Elam. I feel compelled to take a step back from our stated goal of stepping through the hydroplate theory's explanations for the many unique features of our world that appear in part two of Dr. Walt Brown's book, In the Beginning, Compelling Evidence for Creation in the Flood. There's a reason why Dr. Brown placed the 131 categories of scientific evidence that counter the prevailing evolutionary explanations for life the universe and our world in part one of his book. While I don't, won't spend a great deal of time going through these evidences in detail in this video, I do feel compelled to explain why being aware of them is important. It is important to understand that the theory of evolution is a theory in crisis. Understanding this fact will allow you to open your mind and consider alternative explanations for the world we live in. Some people, of course, will claim that there are no evidences that counter evolution. Granted, if you Google any number of the standard explanations for the Earth that I will be pointing out in this video series, you will not return any hits providing contrary evidence. Every article you find will provide the official narrative without one iota of dissent. A good example is plate tectonics, which I just covered in our last video. This is because the narrative is for the common person. You need to be a member of the club in a high level of academia to be privy to the problems with their theories. For this reason, I encourage you to not only read part one of Dr. Brown's book, but I encourage you to read the extensive references and notes section, which provides an inside look into this privileged information. My favorite example of privileged information is from a topic I will cover in some detail in a future video. Go ahead and Google the origin of Earth's moon. The sites that will be brought up for your consideration will confidently state that the moon is caused by a Mars-sized object impacting the early Earth at an acute angle. No dissenting evidence will be offered. Academic researchers into the moon's origin will, however, admit these problems amongst each other in their technical papers and conferences. In fact, because the many problems with the various explanations for the origin of the moon are so egregious that in one article of Nature, the author apparently joked sarcastically, the best explanation was observational error. The moon does not exist. In other words, the experts have no clue how the moon was formed. Very few people know that there is so much evidence that counter the theory of evolution in so many different fields of study. As I said, scientists generally know about the mysteries in their own area of expertise. They are generally ignorant of the contradictory evidence in areas outside of their field. In fact, this typically provides a motivation for these scientists. They might feel that the rest of the scientific establishment has their evolutionary theories figured out, but their own chosen field of study has one or more of the remaining mysteries. They want to be the one to solve the mystery and shore up this embarrassment. You see, there are many people who will dismiss out of hand what we say here in these videos without even opening their mind and listening to what we say first. I think it is safe to say that they do so because of presuppositions and presumptions. Another word that we could use that does not sound so uppity is prejudice. Let's look at what these words mean and you will see that they are all related. Presupposition comes from the words suppose and before. In other words, you suppose something before considering the facts. Presumption comes from the words assume and before. Again, you assume something to be true before listening to the arguments. Prejudice comes from the words judge and before. This would be where you judge a case before weighing the evidence. There are a wide variety of examples of presumptions in the origin debate. The universe began with the Big Bang. Older rock lies below the younger rock. Plate tectonics is what causes the continents to move. Evolution is a fact, not a theory. All of the above statements are merely assertions that have been repeated so many times that people have come to accept them as a matter of course. Someone disagreeing with them would be the height of scientific heresy, and no reasons need to be provided before vilifying that person. Let me ask you, were you there when the universe began? Was anybody there that could witness to that event? No human was there when any of the alleged events of the evolution happened. No one can speak authoritatively about such events with 100% certainty. Someone may now say that science has proven evolution is a fact. I am sorry. To make that statement just goes to show that they don't know how the scientific method works. 
You can look at a hundred different textbooks and come up with a hundred different, but very similar, diagrams of the scientific method. Here is my version of the scientific method in the diagram form. It starts off with you making an observation. The dogs are barking upstairs. And then asking a question about that observation. Why are the dogs barking? The next step is to formulate a hypothesis for your observation. The Amazon delivery guy must have dropped off a package. This leads you to formulate and perform an experiment to test your hypothesis. I'll go upstairs and see if there's an Amazon package on the front porch. Now comes a little known but very important aspect of experiments. You can never prove a hypothesis is true. You can only prove a hypothesis is false. In other words, if your experiment is confirmed. Okay, let's go see if there's a package on the front porch. There is! There is a package on the front porch! Then the most you can say is that the experiment results were consistent with your hypothesis. There may be another hypothesis that is the actual answer to your question that you just had not considered. While the Amazon guy did drop off a package, that's probably not the problem. What the problem was, was the cat brought a chipmunk into the house. And no, my wife did not let me stage that. She put her foot down. But can you imagine? Can you, the, the, the video would have been epic. But if your prediction fails, then you can definitely know your hypothesis is false. Okay, let's go see if there's a package on the front porch. The dogs are barking because I'm opening the front door. I don't know. I don't see a package. Hypothesis not confirmed. So, if your experiment fails, you scrap that hypothesis and formulate a different hypothesis, devise new experiments, and repeat. Even if your experiment is confirmed, it is important you continue to refine the details of your hypothesis and devise more experiments to further validate the hypothesis so as to gain confidence that this hypothesis, as opposed to some other unthought of hypothesis, is the answer to your original question. For this reason, the most knowledge is gained by formulating experiments that try to prove the hypothesis is false, only after your hypothesis has fended off all the attempts at proving it is false that you can think of can you establish confidence in your hypothesis. Only after the hypothesis has been refined to incorporate a comprehensive mechanism through the performance of many repeated experiments, not just by you, but by other scientists acting independently to remove any chance of bias, can a hypothesis be regarded as a scientific theory. So let me ask you, have you heard of any experiments devised to try to prove the theory of evolution false? No, strike that question. That is asking too much. Let's ask some more basic questions. Has anyone accumulated an immense amount of hydrogen and helium in deep space and watched to see if a star and orbiting planets form? Has anyone observed a bird hatch from a lizard egg? Has anyone observed the millions of of generations of the family tree of a lizard to document if there were any focused, upwardly directional DNA changes as the generations progressed? Who was there to observe the first living cell, let alone the first multicellular organism? Unless you all failed science or history in school, you all should be answering no one. Evolution cannot be observed because it progresses too slowly to be observed by any one generation. It cannot be repeated and it allegedly occurred in the past. No, the theory of evolution is not scientific. It is not derived from the application of the scientific method. Hold that thought for just a moment. I just need to clear something up that may be causing a little confusion. It is technically not sufficient to speak of just the theory of evolution. When the average per person hears the phrase, the theory of evolution, that person will usually think of the alleged biological process describing the slow diversion of the many animal species over many generations from a common ancestor many millions of years ago. There are, however, many theories for the origination of the various other physical observations. They are known as the theory of, of chemical evolution, the theory of stellar evolution, the theory of the solar system evolution, etc. 
Thus, when I speak of the theory of evolution, I really mean all of them. So back to the scientific method. Just because the theory of evolution was not derived from the application of the scientific method, that does not mean it is invalid per se. You can make the same argument that the theory of creationism is invalid because it also is not derived from the application of the scientific method. One of those theories may be valid, or neither of them may be valid, but you must discern their validity via a different process. You have to use a process designed for evaluating unrepeatable historical events. Consider how a criminal court of law is used to establish a reasonable certainty or a reasonable doubt about a historical event. A court of law does not use the scientific method to determine guilt or innocence. Do they stuff O.J. Simpson in a test tube to see if he kills his ex-wife and her boyfriend again? While the advocates for the defense actually don't have to prove anything, the prosecution needs to establish a reasonable certainty that the crime progressed in the way they assert. The court of law employs two main types of evidence. One, witness testimony, and two, circumstantial evidence. Since we have already established that nobody was there during the origins of the earth, we are stuck with the latter type of evidence, circumstantial evidence. In a court of law, we already have the observation in the question. A crime was committed, and the question is whether a particular person is guilty. The next step in the process is to develop a hypothesis. However, I am going to make a subtle distinction to try to avoid confusion. I am going to avoid the use of the word hypothesis when it's describing either the court of law or the study of origins to make it clear we are not employing the scientific method. I will use the phrase starting assumptions. Continuing the analogy of the court of law, after the starting assumptions are laid out, advocates for both the prosecution and the defense lay out their cases. After hearing all of the evidence, either the judge or jury renders a verdict based upon their preponderance of the evidence. Basically, the evidence is laid out on the scales of justice, and the scales need to tip to the guilty side beyond a reasonable doubt to convict. This is basically the process used to study the questions of origins. Let's back up to those starting assumptions for the study of origins. What is the starting assumption for the hydroplate theory? The Earth, as it originally existed, contained an outer shell of granite crust 30 to 60 miles thick overlying an interconnected chamber of water. Given that starting assumption, the laws of physics dictate, over time, that the unique features of the Earth as we know it would result. The purpose of this video series is to demonstrate in detail how these laws of physics accomplish that and why the hydroplate theory is the most compelling explanation for our Earth. Now before someone complains that the hydroplate theory does not explain how the Earth came to be constructed as we have presumed, you need to consider what the starting assumption is for the theory of evolution. There is no creator. How does the evolutionist know that? There really isn't anything wrong with this starting assumption per se, except when this presumption is used as supposed evidence to prove this presumption. Really. This practice is described by several terms, such as begging the question and circular reasoning, and it happens more frequently than you might think. For instance, has anyone heard the assertion that science requires naturalism? That is a blatant attempt to cancel all theories but their own by nothing more than an assertion. Google tells me the definition of naturalism is the philosophical belief that everything arises from natural properties and causes and supernatural or spiritual explanation are excluded or discounted. While we admit that the scientific method applies to the physical world as it presently exists, and that natural processes are studied using this method. There is nothing scientific about asserting that there was no creator involved with the creation of the universe in the beginning. By the way, there was a beginning and we will cover that in a future video. The vast majority of the groundbreaking scientists in the course of history believed in a creator. The list you see is a tiny subset of a more complete list. I only included names you might recognize from the various scientific laws or units of measurement for which they were honored. All of these scientists, and many others, knew that the scientific method was the ideal tool to understand the order that existed in the created universe. So when someone invokes naturalism to prove there is no creator, they are using circular reasoning. Usually, circular reasoning manifests itself in the application of various principles or laws of science. For instance, if you look in the 1978 World Book Encyclopedia 
at entries for geology and paleontology penned by the same author, Samuel P. Wells, you will see the following two quotes. Paleontology, the study of fossils, is important in the study of geology. The age of the rocks may be determined by the fossils found in them. And scientists determine when fossils were formed by finding out the age of the rocks in which they lie. So, the age of the rocks may be determined by the fossils found in them, and the age of the fossils is determined by the age of the rocks. I kid you not. I am sure you have all seen the geologic time scale. So, the evolutionary geologist uses his evolutionary model to construct the geologic time scale. And then, the evolutionary geologist uses the geological time scale to prove his evolutionary model. Again, I kid you not. Most of the evolutionary presumptions involve circular reasoning. Another example of one such presumption is the law of superposition. As it appears in the Encyclopedia Britannica, a major principle of stratigraphy stating that within a sequence of layers of sedimentary rock, the oldest layer is at the base and that the layers are progressively younger with ascending order in the sequence. This is just another assertion. Consider this photograph of stratified and sedimentary rock. The law of superposition requires the older rock be at the bottom and the younger rock at the top. Hold on a minute. What is this thing embedded right up through the middle, spanning millions of years of a rock formation? This is a tree trunk which is petrified and it is called a polystrate fossil. Did this tree trunk stand upright and not rot while it took millions of years to deposit and harden the sediments around it? Has it occurred to anyone that maybe all of the layers seen in the sediments were laid down at the same time? at least within the span of weeks or months, before any of it solidified into rock. During those weeks or months, while the sediments were still settling and not yet rock, could hydraulic sorting be responsible for the pattern of stratified layers that you see? I will cover this in more detail when we examine Earth's stratified layers of rock, but the following demonstration is instructive at this time. Here we are back in the shop and we're going to shoot a demonstration. We are going to try to create layered strata of sediments in this, this bottle with the dirt in it. And we're going to do that by liquefaction. This is for a more introductory type video to explain that it does not take millions of years for stratified layers to develop in our sedimentary rock, that it could happen in hours, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, if these sediments are unconsolidated and not lithified into rock at that time. Here's our test rig, and this is the third attempt I've tried to do this. You might see some blips, uh, bloopers of some prior attempts, um, but we have two bottles. If you can see these, we have a bottle of water, we have a bottle of, of dirt and sand, and basically this experiment now is using one part uh, you buy it at Home Depot, uh, general purpose, whatever, sand. It's got uh, varying degrees of very fine grains to little, little, little tiny sand rocks in it. And it's one part that and another part mud slick that I've got off of our uh, walking path back behind our house as it goes down to the woods. So that mud slick has Tennessee clay in it. It has some little rocks, it has some vegetable matter from the leaves and so forth from the trees. Um, just a little bit of that. So it's a, it's a one to one ratio at this moment. So basically we have some dirty sand. Uh, part of the test rig here is I have got some this little squares of screen at the top of this bottle, which will be the bottom of the bottle because once I get this thing going, I'm going to move water from the bottle hanging here up through the sediments in the bottle on this side because this thing will teeter-totter um, and then we'll reverse the process and so when water flows up through the bottle of dirt it will liquefy the sediments it will raise them up as the water flows up and allow them to resettle then we'll teeter-totter the other direction water will flow from the dirt bottle back to the other bottle um, and it'll compress the sediments and it will reverse the process and we will do this repeatedly and with a repeated process we should get some stratification of the layers by density of the sediments, shape of the sediments, and size of the sediments. Yes, muck, mud, sand will flow backwards in this process, back towards the clean bottle and through this tubing. Um, the screen is here just to minimize how much 
actually moves. And without further ado, I'm going to set the bottles up and then we're going to start moving water. Not sure if you can see it, but I'm back and I have provided a small vent hole into the bottoms of each of these bottles and the movement of water happened immediately. I've got my first uh, liquefaction of that bottle as the water rushed into it. Trouble is when it does this, water will go out the top of the bottle because there's a hole in it. And demonstrating that yes, muck will move from one bottle to the next. Okay, we have results. I went for an even two dozen oscillations of the water, so I did two dozen liquefaction cycles on this bottle. We got some good results. It's not perfect, and I will tell you that there's some art to this. If you move water up through this bottle too slowly, it's too slow to lift the sediments, and you don't get any liquefaction. You don't, you don't get that layer, that wave of, of water passing up through as it, as it lifts the sediment. So that's if you go too slow. If you go too fast, you get what's called flow channels, where flow will just pick a channel and, and go through, and it will bypass, the flow will bypass all the other sediments. It'll just flow up a single channel. And you can see that I did have some flow channels on several cycles on the camera side of this bottle. If you do it at the perfect rate, you will get a wave of the fluid passing up through the sediments. You get this wave of liquefaction and you'll get some nice layers. The sad part is, is it only takes one time where you go too fast, you get a flow channel through this bottle and you've wiped out the layers that you had just made. This is actually the angle that I was seeing as I did this. And you can see here, there is some stratification of the sediments based on size, density, and shape of the sediment particles. So I was seeing some uh, stratification build up, which I would blow sometimes because I uh, move the water too fast. What was amazing though, I want to show you this bottle. This bottle started out being all water. Well, as I said, water and sediments would move back and forth between the, the bottles. And I want to show you the other side where the view is the best. No rocks made it from one bottle to the other. Only the smaller sediments moved. Uh, but you can see that we did deposit quite a bit of sediments in this, what, the water bottle. It started off with just water in it. But you can definitely see the strata, the layer caking of the sediments based on the size, shape, and density of the particles. And the different layers are related to which of the, you know, the two dozen, two dozen cycles of, of uh, moving water back and forth that I did. So you definitely can see, you don't get seasick, you can see the layered strata. This goes to show that you do not need millions of years to develop strata in sedimentary rock, that it can be done over the periods of minutes or hours, days, weeks, or months, as you have continuous deposition of particles. Several days have passed by. I've done some more cycles of the bottles. And you'll see some thicker layers at the top because uh, I waited longer between each cycle. Basically did several per day here. And uh, there was more time for the sediments to settle, so some of the layers are thicker. Hopefully this is a better view of the strata. The assertion of the law of superposition leads to another line of thinking when observing tipped, buckled, and folded sedimentary layers of rock. The first picture is from Dr. Walt Brown's book, and the second picture is from the free Best of Being wallpaper theme. The tipping, buckling, and folding of this rock is truly spectacular. The evolutionary thinking proceeds along the following lines. Because we know these rock layers represent millions of years, and they were all solidified long before the layers tipped, buckled, and folded, then we can conclude that crystalline rock is ductile. 
It must be able to deform over long periods of time under modest forces. Plate tectonics is therefore possible because convection cells can be established in the ductile mantle rock. Furthermore, plate tectonics must be happening because all of our other theories have flopped. Hence, anybody who is a non-believer in plate tectonics is a know-nothing scientific heretic. We don't even need to give them the time of day. You can work this logic in reverse direction through presumption after presumption until you arrive at the mother of all presumptions, that there was no creator. Running the clock forward again, the evolutionist starts from that initial presumption that there is no creator and reaches each successive conclusion without considering any alternative interpretations for the evidence. So, I implore you to examine with an open mind each assertion of the prevailing scientific explanations for the world around us. Ask yourself if this is an explanation that has factored in all evidence, or if it is merely a presumption that conveniently ignores the evidence that is unfavorable to this establishment narrative. I hope that you have found this video helpful. Please remember that you do not have to be bullied into believing the theory of evolution. Thank you. <laughs> Who here voted but this being a mess? It's a mess. Thing. I have got some lensing, by the way. We'll talk about that later, but... Whoa! If you do it at the perfect... Don't move that.